BCG vaccines to enhance oral SIV acquisition in infant macaques. So I also like to thank the organizers um, for giving us the opportunity to present our data and I like to thank the hardcore that is still here listening. Um, so our lab is really interested in mother to child transmission of HIV and how to prevent it. And despite all the progress that we have made with antiretroviral therapy, um, you have heard at this meeting as well that we still are faced with a cascade effect and what that means is that there is a significant drop off from getting HIV infected uh, or getting pregnant women tested for HIV, getting them into care and retaining them in care and eventually also having their infants tested for HIV and maybe enrolled in ART care. And so for that very reason, we still have a significant number of um, HIV acquisitions by breast milk transmission now. And so our goal is to, to find ways to prevent that. The other important point that I want to make is that you have to remember that in those areas where HIV transmission by breastfeeding is occurring the most, those are also the, the countries where you have extremely high rates of tuberculosis. And so um, just in Africa, it is estimated that in, in South Africa, the infection rate of children per year is 3% and at a median age of about one year, so right during the breastfeeding period, and in fact, there are a lot of co-infections going on. And so um, we feel that until we can achieve universal and global coverage of ART for HIV infection or even treatment for drugs uh, for tuberculosis, um, we should still pursue HIV vaccine, vaccine design in parallel. And so with HIV, we haven't been successful so far, but there is actually a vaccine against TB, and that's a Basil gamet vaccine that has been around for many, many years. The advantage of this vaccine is that it's actually one of the very few vaccines that can be given at birth. So that is really an advantage in resource poor countries because that's when the moms are in the clinic. It would also be very advantageous if you think about preventing breast milk transmission of a pathogen. This vaccine is extremely immunogenic even in the infants that have a relatively immature immune system. But there's a caveat that um, BCG, because it's a life attenuated vaccine, has been shown that it could disseminate in HIV infected infants and actually cause um, a TB-like uh, disease. So our goal was to develop a pediatric HIV TB combination vaccine to come up with a vaccine that could be given at birth and potentially infect infants against both HIV acquisition and TB infections. And instead of using BCG, we proposed that we would use an oxytoph, so highly attenuated um, human adapted mycobacterium tuberculosis strain that was engineered to also express HIV antigens. Um, so as I said, these, these oxytroph mutants of MTB, they are highly attenuated for application and pathogenicity, and um, you can further manipulate them and delete genes that are used by the bugs for immune evasion, and then you can modify them to express HIV antigens. And in our previous studies, we have identified one of those strains, the MC6435. It's a lucidy pancidy mutant that is also deleted in the Seki2 um, locus. And so um, we have previously shown that um, this MTB um, SIV vaccine is safe in neonatal macaques, even in SIV infected neonatal macaques and it is also immunogenic and can induce immune responses to SIV as well as TB antigens. So what I want um, to present today is um, the efficacy studies, and because this is an HIV meeting, the efficacy against all SIV exposure. So because our lab is really interested in preventing mother to child transmission, especially by breastfeeding, we first developed a repeated low-dose oral challenge model in neonatal macaques using the pathogenic SIV MAC251 stream to really recapitulate the frequent exposure infants experience um, that are breastfeeding from HIV-infected mothers. And I think um, you can clearly see that we were able to develop a low-dose ch um, challenge model. The probability of exposure was 025 
And so this model now allows us to test our vaccine for um, sterilizing immunity, meaning no infection or at least partial um, efficacy by looking at the numbers of exposures that are needed to induce persistent infection. So um, coming to our vaccine study, we had um, two, beside this mock group, we had two vaccine groups. Um, both vaccine groups received the recombinant MTBSIV vaccine at birth. Uh, they received it orally to induce uh, mucosal responses that would be relevant um, to protect against an oral um, SIV challenge or HIV challenge in human infants. And then the first group was homologously boosted at birth with MTB SIV by the intradermal route, just like the BCG vaccine, and the second group received an intramuscular boost at two times with MVA SIV. And then at nine weeks of age, we started our repeated low-dose oral challenge regimen. And I think, as you can see um, right away, to our big surprise and, and very unexpectedly, what we had to realize is that independent of the boost regimen in our first vaccine groups, four of the six animals, and the second group, seven of the eight animals, became in fact persistently infected after only two SIV um, oral exposures. So this was not only unexpected, it was actually a scary result because it suggested that maybe our vaccine increased susceptibility to oral SIV acquisition. So obviously um, we felt very compelled to, to repeat these studies and to confirm our data and so here is the result of all our MTB um, vaccines that we tested of all our animals. So we repeated the study, included more animals, and we also tested to really prove that it might have been related to the MTB component, because if you remember the previous slide, we had the same outcome independent of the boost. So our um, conclusion from that was that the increased infectivity was most likely due to the MTB component. So we also included an, a vaccine in this group um, that received no further boosts. And we also included BCG as a control group and we administered a, the vaccine intradermally at birth. And as you can see again, we saw the same result. The majority of animals became infected after two exposures. So what this data is showing you that our effect was seen independent of the mycobacterial strain. It didn't matter if it was mycobacterium tuberculosis or mycobacterium bovis. It was independent of the route. It was observed after all as well as intradermal inoculation. It was also independent of the boost and definitely independent of the SIV insert. And so when you, when you look at the outcome overall, this is the probability of infection. So what you see here is the number of exposures versus the percent of animals infected. And I think you can very clearly see that our mock infected animals um, needed more exposures to become systemically infected compared to our vaccinees. Um, was it statistically significant? No, it was not statistically significant. Um, but what I want to... Um, really point out is that sometimes you have to keep in mind what the biological significance could mean. And so we definitely saw an enhancement of infection in, in both studies. Um, and if you look at the mean exposure that is needed to um, induce persistent infection in these various groups, you can see that our vaccine groups really required fewer exposures. And um, on top of it, when we looked at our BCG vaccinated animals, they also showed increased peak viremia um, post challenge. So we wanted to look for further evidence to, to really um, further confirm that we have a real problem at our hand here. And so the first thing that comes to mind if you think about HIV acquisition and increasing the risk is that maybe our vaccine induced systemic immune activation, which would fuel virus replication. So we tested the plasma of these animals at the time of challenge um, for all the players that you know of um, that are poor inflammatory in nature and none of those markers was elevated in our vaccinees compared to the mock animals. The one marker that came up, however, that was strikingly higher in the plasma of our vaccinees was MCP1, so an, a marker of monocyte activation. And sure enough, when we run additional ELISAs for soluble CD14 and soluble CD163, 
We also saw that our vaccinees had elevated levels in the plasma at the time of challenge. And that was consistent with, um, with monocyte activation in peripheral blood. So when we looked at the time of challenge, the monocytes in our vaccinees, depicted in gray again, they had increased frequencies of CCR5 and CD69 positive uh, monocytes in the blood, which makes total sense because these are the cells that are the target cells for mycobacteria, which is our vaccine strain. And um, importantly, um, we also saw increased functional capacity of these cells. So we measured in, in vitro, we stimulated these cells with TLR agonist and then measured their cytokine production and both TNF-alpha and IL-12 production was increased in the monocytes of our vaccinees compared to um, our control animals. And importantly, we had access to archived samples, so we did a really thorough retrospective analysis. So we had vaccinated animals from which we had um, blood and tissue samples left, and these animals were not challenged with SRV. And we could detect those marked differences in activation up to 18 weeks post-vaccination. In addition, we observed CD4 T cell activation. So again, in the blood, what we noticed was that um, our CD4 T cells um, were increased in frequencies of cells that contained the core receptor for, for HIV and SIV CCR5. They also, um, we also observed increased um, frequencies of activated T cells when we looked at KI67, CD69. And again, just as we observed for monocytes, and this is just one example, in this case, KI67, it's true for all these markers. Um, when we looked 18 weeks post-vaccination SIV naive tissues, um, we saw again that this immune activation in the CD4 T cell population persisted. And I'm showing you data here for the retropharyngeal lymph node and the colon, because those are potential entry sites for HIV or SRV after oral exposure. So in summary, what I'm showing you is that our MTB and BCG-based uh, vaccines cause persistent immune activation, that we saw an increase um, in potential target cells for the virus, and this may have contributed and resulted for, uh, in the increased risk of oral SIV acquisition. There's also a potential risk that challenge outcome pathogenesis might be increased by these vaccines as well. I didn't have time to show the data, but these differences in immune activation persisted even post-challenge. And um, I also couldn't show you the data, but um, this risk was not associated with MHC phenotype or trim 5 alpha So to show you that this is not an artifact of an HP study, I want to point out a few things from, from human data. So BCG, as I pointed out earlier, is strongly immunogenic, has a huge adjuvant activity, and this is actually now called trained immunity. It was recently shown by Nitea et al. that even if you vaccinate adults, um, that, that, these, that this vaccine will induce epigenetic changes, especially in the myeloid cell population, which leads, leads to um, increased responsiveness that is not just observed to a mycobacterial antigen, but also to unrelated antigens, which is totally consistent with our results of seeing persistent um, monocyte activation and increased functional capacity. Um, there's also data that, that BCG may be a risk factor for HIV, consistent with our data of increased CD4 T cell activation. Um, most importantly, Heather Jaspin reported three years ago at an HIV vaccine conference that she observed in South African infants that um, uh, CD4 T cells showed increased expression of CCR5. And there are also in vitro data that, that confirm these data. So I really think that these data may have um, impact on our um, vaccine design and should be taken seriously. By no means I want to diminish any efforts um, of TB vaccine design. I think those novel Oxitrove BCG and Oxitrove MTB strains that are being developed for uh, STB vaccines, some of them made it into the clinic or are very close. Um, there are also other groups that are pursuing them as combination vaccines, and in some studies they have been shown to be extremely immunogenic, 
and they may even protect us against TB infection. What I want to raise is that I, there might be a huge impact for the pediatric in, um, population and um, because they may increase the risk. So my appeal is that at a minimum when we activate or when we test novel TB vaccines, we should include um, testing for immune activation in the safety assessment of these vaccines. And um, there were lots of people that contributed. I want to thank especially Cara Jensen, who did most of the work, um, many other collaborators that are listed here. And I really want to point out also that we had great support by program HIV, as well as TB program officers to um, repeat those studies and confirm our findings. Thank you. Any questions? Um, so that was really interesting, thank you. What were the ages of the infants when they were given their BCG? So we, we vaccinated the neonatal macaques within the first week of life. So to be, so that would be similar to the human situation when they get BCG, with the goal that you want to vaccinate when you have the highest chance of reaching the moms in the clinic and the kids. Um, but in the setting, I'm just curious about uh, plans to test perhaps BCG delivery delay, because I know there have been interest, especially in HIV infected, Heather Jasper's mm -hmm. group, um, that delayed BCG to eight weeks or 12 weeks of life, and that might give the time for the infant's immunity to settle down a little bit before hitting them with the uh, combined vaccine. Right, so that is definitely a good point, and I think, um, so we are doing other studies in the lab where we uh, will explore vaccinating later, not with this vaccine, but just in general to overcome some of the hurdles that the immature immune system gives us. I think in this case, I mean, our challenge started at nine weeks and um, we observed persistence of immune activation up to 18 weeks of age. So, and, and that was after a single immunization. And um, the work by Natea where he vaccinated actually adults with BCG, he observed that um, functional responses to, uh, to MTB antigens and to, uh, to other unrelated antigens like to Candigata and, and Aureus, Staph Aureus, they, they were still enhanced one year later in the adult population. So that would suggest if there are indeed epigenetic changes that are responsible or that are underlying this immune activation, um, that it would make a difference if you would delay vaccination or not. But we haven't tested that, so I, I don't know. Okay. Sorry, if, if I can have a question over here. I just wanted to make sure that I understood completely. So your immunization was actually oral. Yes. Um, do you think it might be different because the BCG vaccination is... is, is we gave the BCG, normal. when we included our BCG group, we gave the BCG to the uh, infant macaques by the intradermal route. So, so it didn't make a difference. And we actually, in earlier studies, when we assessed, um, assessed the safety of the vaccine, prior to our challenge study, we had actually explored the oral and the intradermal route, and we had access to some of those archived tissue samples as well, and we also saw immune activation after intradermal. So administration. That, so it wasn't the route. It wasn't the route. It so wasn't that, that's the quite route. worrisome in South Africa where mm -hmm. BCG vaccination at birth is universal and they don't like to delay it because of the big, big challenge there would be with coverage if right, they tried exactly. to delay it. Mm -hmm. so, so, I mean, I, I, I mean what, what do you think? I mean, my, my children are BCG vaccinated at birth. Every, almost everybody is who gives birth in yes. the hospital. I, 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 I think BCG vaccination should continue. I'm not saying you should stop it because you have to weigh the two evils against each other and um, in South Africa, especially where you are, I mean, the rate of infection is so high and the risk for those infants to become TB infected, I think you, you need to continue to give the BCG vaccine because we don't have a better vaccine yet. Um, all I'm saying is that um, we should keep in mind, I, I think 
the BCG was definitely the worst. I mean, I couldn't show all the data. So if you look at all the activation data, BCG was always the worst. So these oxytoph mutants are definitely better, but they still induce some activation. And I, um, there are some groups now, um, I was talking to someone at Hopkins just this week, and, um, and they are trying to figure out what genes in those mycobacteria may be responsible for that. And so there's definitely a way to make those strains safer. So all I'm saying is that people should be aware of it. And the normal vaccine testing doesn't really include testing for immune activation. Or even if they would test the plasma, TNF, IL-6, those markers don't come up IL-1. You know, it's, it was really only those monocyte activation markers that we saw really elevated. Yeah. So, yeah, but, I mean, but the risk of HIV acquisition after birth is also... It's um, also very high, yeah. So it's, but it's worrisome. Just, just the idea, just raising it, is yes. kind of something to pay attention to. Anyway, mm -hmm. thanks very much. You're welcome. Thank you. Christina? Yeah, oops. Have you ever thought of looking at oral polio vaccine? Because we're giving that also routinely in a lot of... At the polio vaccine? Yeah, the oral polio vaccine. I mean, I can imagine if BCG given intradermally causes uh -huh. this mm -hmm. gut um, CD4 activation. Uh -huh. What the... What does oral what does the oral polio vaccine do that's actually activating cells in the gut? Okay. As part no, of the I haven't looked. That's a great idea. Yeah, no, I, I have not looked. <laughs> and because I don't think we're going to get rid of OPV for a long time. And right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, because again, it's.